still, still in the honeymoon. Yeah, right. Whether you went on a honeymoon or not. <laughs> so, so let's see. Here is. Okay, you're you're ready to go. Okay. All right. Um, so is uh, are is are people all? Um, we can hear you on the Discord. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, let me finish off a the couple of these questions here, and uh, uh, and then we'll, then I'll start the lecture. Um, so back to all heart. Back to the question about the hyperbolic. Uh, uh, are, is, are people all? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I forgot to mute. Apologies. Oh, okay. No problem. Um, okay. All right. Well, okay. Um, <clears throat> so as to the hyperbolic uh, questions, um, when you when you when you encounter something like that. You have to ask what is, what is he, what is he really saying? What is the, and then what is the tradition of the church? How do we understand and interpret this? Um, and so, uh, very often we need to look to the writings of the holy fathers um, to uh, who interpret these statements. Um, uh, you know, sometimes sometimes the statements are. Um, are hyperbolic. Sometimes they're, they're symbolic. Sometimes they're typological. Uh, sometimes they're allegorical. Sometimes they're moral. Um, sometimes he'll say one thing in one place and then uh, it's presented in a different way in a different place. And so uh, you have to kind of, you have to figure out what it is that's being said and then check with the Holy Fathers to on the interpretation to understand how the church has understand has understood these things, um, and uh, but but really the whole I think one of the most important things is to is to know that uh, the church does not um, accept do, does not take the scriptures only in a literal way. Um, so good faith. I've heard it said that God knows who will be saved, but if we all have free will and presumably can choose the light or the dark in an undetermined way, does the Lord know the outcome already, meaning our path is already determined? If so, is this not a contradiction to the free will? The Lord knows, the Lord knows what uh, our choices are going to be because uh, he sees our life uh, both in the beginning and the end and everything in between as a, as a single continuity. Um, however, uh, that does not mean that everything is determined. He knows what's going to happen. Um, he uh, responds to us along the way, um, but, uh, but we, have, we truly have free will. Um, we are not, we're not automatons. We're not, we're not manipulated. Um, nothing uh, from, from the divine perspective, um, you can say that uh, the outcome is already known, but from our perspective, um, it's up to us what choices we make. So, uh, so our will truly is free um, with the exception that it's uh, handicapped by sin. Um, uh, Jonathan, I heard it said that God knows who will be, okay. Okay, that was that. Okay, you answered. I think there's a difference between knowing what someone will do and having no will uh, uh, to choose your. Yes, you've got it exactly. Um, McIntyre, I'm struggling to discern the church. What you recommend to someone who knows very little about orthodoxy and is more in, in more agreement with the Protestants? Well, you're in a um, you're in an interesting place. I think historically, um, it's very important that you. Uh, uh, that you consider uh, the church, you consider the fathers of the church, and um, you'll find you'll find very little support um, for most of the Protestant uh, positions uh, when you look at the history of the church. 
but I would suggest that you do your homework. Um, but don't, but don't necessarily read Protestant sources. You can actually read secular sources, um, which will, uh, which just present the history. And um, I would suggest uh, to, uh, um, you know, to look at it, but especially look at look at the early fathers, uh, the apostolic fathers. Um, uh, I think uh, those first generations of Christians after uh, uh, after Christ and the apostles uh, really set the uh, uh, the bar for um, what is uh, um, you know for for the basis of of the Catholic faith and the apostolic faith that is once delivered uh, uh, by Christ to the apostles and has been passed on uh, uh, over the centuries uh, through the, uh, uh, from bishop to bishop um, through apostolic succession. Um, Luke, God bless you. Be a valiant warrior for Christ. That's a beautiful thing. Um, and no man, no cry. How can we get better at understanding God, what God's desire is for our life? Well, the first thing, is, God's desire for our life is that we all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, which means to know God and Jesus Christ, his son. Um, and then as we, as we grow in that knowledge of God, uh, it'll become more and more clear uh, what, uh, what he wants us to do with our life. Um, it's a great mystery of, uh, of God's providence, how he reveals uh, his will to us, but he does. So um, with that, I would like to... Uh, oh. Okay, Luke, back to your question. How am I? I'm doing very well, thank God. Um, so, all right. So I'm gonna get to the, uh, um, uh, the talk that I prepared for tonight, um, which I entitle A Rule of Life. So we talked about um, the, the three, pri three principles of, uh, of Orthodox Christian spirituality last night, or last time. Um, do not resent, do not react, keep inner stillness. And all of these are themes that are going to uh, come out in the course of the lecture um, and will be, um, uh, and are things that I bring up constantly because quite frankly, I really believe in this. I, I've seen it. I've seen it work, and it's um, the really the uh, the core of um, the Orthodox experience, the Orthodox faith. So, and it certainly is a summary of the Philokalia that do not resent, do not react, keep inner stillness. Um, in fact, I'll put that down in the questions. But one of the things that each one of us needs as we, as we put this into action um, is a rule of life, um, which is much more than just a prayer rule, much more than just following the rules of the church. Um, it's, a, it's an entire discipline of life um, in which, which governs every aspect um, of, of what we do, how we act, uh, how we interact with people, um, and also how we interact with ourselves. Um, and, and of course, especially with God. Um, it's a discipline to lead a life of repentance. And repentance, if I remind, to remind you, means to be transfigured in the renewal of your mind. Romans 12, 2. Be transfigured in the renewal of your mind. Um, in other words, repentance 
is not about feeling guilty. Repentance is about uh, changing your whole, changing your consciousness on the highest levels. And it's that change of consciousness, that, that change of mind, that reorientation of life towards, uh, towards God um, and the opening of our spiritual eyes and the nurturing and the developing of our spiritual awareness, which is the awareness of God, the awareness of, of, uh, of, this, of spiritual reality, noetic reality, <clears throat> that is the real heart and soul of what um, authentic spirituality is and, and, what, and what orthodoxy is. None of the other, <clears throat> none of the other forms of Christianity uh, really emphasize or retain this. Um, this is something that is uh, very much, um, uh, well, that is the Orthodox tradition, the Eastern tradition, um, and has been now for, you know, almost two millennia. So, <clears throat> so how, do we, how do we lead this disciplined life of repentance? What is discipline? Basically, discipline means um, to, it, discipline is connected with, with the word disciple, uh, which means to be a student. It means to learn from the Lord. It means to, to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ um, and a disciple of a spiritual father. Um, one of the most important things that you can have um, in life is a, is a relationship with a spiritual father. Um, and this relationship is, uh, is a relationship of where you look to him for direction, where you look to him for, uh, to confess your sins and, uh, and, and to help you along the path to Christ. Discipline is connected with obedience. Um, obedience, of course, is not very politically correct, and it's not very popular. Um, and uh, most young guys have, have spent years rebelling against obedience. Well, it's time to lay the rebellion aside, um, at least against obedience, and, uh, and start looking at the authentic obedience that we need to have as Christians. Of course, one of the most basic aspects of that um, uh, in which we learn obedience is being obedient to our parents um, as children. Um, now that's not a common thing anymore. And, uh, and people are much the worse as a result. Um, but that obedience is precisely one of the things that enables us to grow and to, be, uh, to become mature. Um, because it means to be able to cut off our selfishness, to cut off our self-will, and, uh, and to focus on uh, the needs of other people first and foremost. Um, the ability to, to get over our ego, our egocentrism, um, all, of, all of that, um, which is actually part of our brokenness, um, but which we mistakenly think is, uh, is our self. It's our false self um, that we have created. It's not the person that God created us to be. Um, so the first and, for, first and foremost, we need to be obedient to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings of the Holy, Holy Apostles, which we find in the Gospels and in, in the New Testament. Um, uh, there's a very... Uh, uh, comprehensive moral teaching um, in, the, uh, in the Gospels, in the New Testament. There's a comprehensive teaching about faith, and this is developed by the Holy Fathers and interpreted to us by the Holy Fathers. And to a great degree, what is this, uh, what the, what is this teaching but a striving towards the virtues? Now, St. Paul lists the virtues in Galatians 23. Um, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Um, we might add to these 
chastity, humility, obedience, stability, and patience. You might also look at the prayer of St. Ephraim, um, which we say during Lent. Um, that's, even though we use it during Lent liturgically, it's something that you can include in your daily prayers any time of the year. It's not, not strictly for use during Lent. When we begin to conform our life to, to the virtues, when we, when we strive to cast off everything that is contrary to the virtues, um, then, then we begin to liken ourselves to Christ. If you remember um, in Genesis, it talks, uh, talks that, or it says that we were uh, uh, created in the image and the likeness of God. In Orthodox understanding, the image of God is not only our noetic awareness, but it's also pure potential. And that potential needs to be actualized. And the actualization of that potential is through moral action by uniting our will with God's will, by living according to the natural will um, of human nature, which God created for us, and to live according to that nature. Now, um, the Holy Fathers developed this very extensively, and it, and it becomes quite a, uh, um, uh, a complex theology. But the, um, but, the ta but our task is to develop ourselves through, uh, through developing that potential, which we, which we do by entering into synergy with the divine will. Because God created human nature in a certain way, um, which, which can only be fulfilled by living in synergy with God. Um, and when we act contrary to nature, um, which, is, uh, which is what the vices are, uh, which, which is what, what sin is, um, uh, we damage ourselves. And we damage our ability to be in synergy, in communion, in union, with God and with the divine will. Um, and so the task is to actualize that potential of image in likeness to God, in likeness to Christ, so that, um, and ultimately so that we will become like him as he is, um, and uh, which, is, which is really an eschatological state that will be given to us by grace in the second coming. Um, if you remember, we just had the reading, um, I think last weekend, um, uh, the young man comes to the Lord and says, Lord, what do I need to do to, be, uh, to inherit eternal life? And the Lord says, keep the commandments. And the, Lord, and the young man says to him, well, I've done all of that from my youth. What more can I do? And the Lord looked at him and said, if you would be perfect, if you would be perfect, go sell all you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. In other words, detach yourself from all the things of this world and unite yourself to Christ. Um, there's another place where, uh, where the Lord says, be perfect as our father in heaven is perfect. Now, a lot of people have tormented themselves with this for centuries. Um, and much of it is, I think, through an incorrect interpretation. Because it's not be perfect. It's rather an eschatological statement. You will be perfect. Because that perfection is something that is finally a gift of the Holy Spirit and brings us to that that fullness of likeness to Christ, which is uh, which we can only attain to through the resurrection. However, in this life, we can liken ourselves to Christ. 
And, and what is the description of that likeness to Christ? It's love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, uh, self-control, right? It's, um, it's humility and chastity, obedience, uh, stability, patience. These are, these are the descriptions of a, of a, of a person who has uh, united themselves to Christ and, and, and is in the process of becoming like Christ. And so our, and our whole life and our whole path to salvation, our path towards deification is this process. And you can't expect that you'll ever achieve it in this life fully. Um, because there's always far more, infinitely more, um, than we can achieve in this life. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And it's, it's that trying and, and it's through that uh, gradual uh, likening of ourselves by practicing the virtues um, that we will uh, be able to um, grow into grow into that likeness. Really, this is what salvation is about. This is the path to salvation. Um, it's not about, you know, the Protestant idea that um, you can say a little prayer and repent once, and then all of a sudden, bang, you're saved, is delusion. It's delusion. It's based on false teaching from Calvin who's a heretic. We cannot accept that teaching. And it leads to spiritual desolation and disaster. Um, <clears throat> and Seth, your comment is exactly right. It prevails beyond the Calvinists um, because that's be Calvinist teaching has become um, something that has uh, permeated evangelicalism. The orthodox critique of evangelicalism is very, very um, important. Um, I would also, I would strongly encourage you to, to look at Father uh, Josiah Trenum's book, Rock and Sand um, on Protestantism. Um, it's a history of Protestantism and is excellent and a very, very focused. Um, now, back to the virtues. I think we all understand the major, the major virtues. Uh, love, joy, peace, long suffering. Now these, these virtues are not simply dispositions of mind. When we purify ourselves from sin, when we purify ourselves from our passions, these become the natural expressions of, of a soul that is, that is in communion with God. These are not simply human um, habits of being. These, these are divine attributes that are the gift of grace. And so uh, it's very important to remember that, uh, that the grace of God is the very essence and the substance of what enables us to pursue the path of virtue. And, um, and as a result, um, the virtues are those things that begin to describe our souls. Um, now, those are, those are, the, um, those are the virtues from, um, uh, that, that St. Paul outlines in Galatians uh, 5.23. I list some other virtues too, chastity, humility, obedience, stability, uh, patience. Chastity, we're going to talk about um, a little bit later in regards to confession. Um, but, but the idea of chastity uh, doesn't, doesn't, is not simply about sex. Chastity means wholeness of wisdom, if you look at the Slavonic understanding. Um, and that 
wholeness of wisdom, in other words, integrity of being, um, uh, embraces not just, not just sexual behavior, but it embraces um, every aspect of our behavior. There's another virtue I, in here that um, I neglected to put down, and that's sobriety. Sobriety is one of, is probably one of the most important themes uh, in Orthodox spiritual literature. Sobriety doesn't mean simply um, not partaking of um, uh, alcohol or uh, other um, intoxicating substances. Sobriety is a state of a state of being, a state of consciousness in which um, in which we're truly aware and truly and and in control of ourselves, um, and how often we are not in control of ourselves when we get. Um, whether there are substances involved or not, uh, we can be drunk on our passions. Uh, we can be drunk on anger. We can be drunk on despondency and despair. We can be drunk on pride or vainglory. We can be drunk on envy um, and avarice and not to, and, uh, and all of these other, you know, all the other passions um, which really, uh, drag us down and make our lives miserable. Um, but we'll, I'll talk about the passions in a few minutes. Um, humility. Humility does not mean bowing and scraping and, uh, and all of that kind of stuff. Humility means being real, being absolutely honest. Um, and uh, when you can be absolutely honest, um, with yourself, with yourself about your sins, with yourself about your shortcomings, with yourself about um, who you really are and not who you imagine you are or not who you imagine you want to be, but who you are right now, that's a good beginning. It's a good beginning. Humility means also means living according to these virtues, kindness, gentleness, patience, long suffering. Um, it means you're not, you're not um, asserting yourself over other people. It's not asserting your will over other people. Um, it's uh, serving them and cooperating with them and loving them um, even if they hurt you and it, and it means to forgive. So humility is something that, um, that is essential for uh, Christianity. You, um, uh, I can't emphasize that enough. Stability. Now, um, everybody knows the, the, monas the, old, the monastic vows, poverty, chastity, and obedience, um, but there's a fourth vow, and that's stability. Um, but stability is necessary uh, in whatever state of life we're in. Not just that we're going to stay in the same place and and uh, do you know stay in the same marriage or say, stay in the same monastery or whatever it is. Stability means inner stability, and it's connected with sobriety. It means that we we don't allow ourselves to become um, to be swayed by every emotion, every feeling, every, in fact, um, the, our sobriety and our stability are intimately connected so that, so that we don't allow ourselves to get manipulated by our own emotions or by anybody else. So, um, in patience, um, I like to think that um, I learned patience when I lived in Russia. Um, when you have to wait in line for all sorts of things, of course, that's long before uh, most of the people listening here were born. Um, uh, and um, when you have to, when you want to go to confession and the line is four hours long, 
for example. Um, there's all sorts of ways in which Russia teaches its patience. Um, and in our, uh, in our culture, patience is absolutely unthinkable, practically. So, um, but patience is, is definitely a virtue um, that we need to embrace. So as we, as we think, as we look at, um, look at the, the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ, the teachings of the Holy Apostles, how do we, how do we learn these teachings? Well, first and foremost, the most important Orthodox book you can read, bar none, is the New Testament. Um, as Orthodox Christians, we should know the Bible, we should know the New Testament and the Old Testament, but the New Testament in particular, inside out, backwards and forwards. I have a long way to go, um, but, uh, but this, is, this, is, this should be our goal. Um, we need to know it uh, because it's our book. We wrote it, we edited it, and we published it. We let other people use it, though they don't understand it, because it's out of context. Um, the, only, uh, the only full context for the New Testament, which is one of the Orthodox liturgical books, and this is important, is that the new that it is well the ultimate context. I think you can see that is the center of the altar. That's where the gospels belong, but it also belongs in the center of our heart. Um, and when we read the New Testament, um, instead of asking yourself um, or a group, well, what do I think of this or that saying or this or that point in the New Testament? We ask ourselves, how does this challenge my life? Am I living up to this or am I falling short in this? We do not judge the New Testament. We do not judge the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles. It judges us. And it's so important spiritually to let it judge us and to shape ourselves according to those teachings. Because if we believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, how can we not uh, have his teachings as the very heart and soul of what we believe, of what we read, of what we teach, and, and of how we act? So, um, it's, also, it's also very important to understand that the New Testament uh, is not a guide to setting up churches and things like that. The Orthodox, the, the church wrote the New Testament as it is. Um, it uh, assembled the writings of the apostles and, and validated them and uh, argued about them until, uh, until the, it was uh, uh, understood what was authentic and what was not. Um, uh, and the New Testament uh, achieved its final form in the year 394, 394. Now, just as a matter of fact, that's after the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, after the liturgy of St. Basil, and after the, uh, after the liturgy of St. James, and after the liturgy of the Roman Church as well. And after the liturgy of East Syria, Adai and Mari, of, of, um, of Egypt, St. Mark, and so forth. The church came before the Bible, and the Bible is the product of the church, and the tradition is, to a great extent, the, the means by which we understand the Bible. That's an essential aspect of the tradition. Um, our task 
is to conform ourselves to the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ so that we can be like him and so that, um, so that his grace can operate in our hearts. So, um, so that's, that's this, this first level of discipline. Um, to, be, to live a disciplined life according to the teachings of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the apostles. There's a second level, another level of discipline, um, the rules of the church. Now, these are rules of piety. Uh, the church gives us guidelines. The word canon does not mean um, law. The word canon means a ruler, like a yardstick. Um, by which you measure things. And so the canons are those, are those uh, principles by which we measure our progress, by which we measure our life, by which we see whether our behavior holds up to the standard, the standard of which is usually uh, ultimately rooted in uh, the teaching of the apostles in the Holy Scriptures. Um, so the church gives us rules as a means of which, or which are really more like principles um, by which we guide our life and ways of applying those principles. Now, for example, the church has all sorts of rules about fasting. Um, and these are these kind of, the, these and other rules are means by which we can measure our own practice against an ideal practice. The, I, the church, uh, the way that the canons work in the Orthodox Church is very different than the way that these rules and canons work in the Roman Catholic Church. and the Protestant Church, God only knows. Um, there's a million different varieties. But in the Roman Catholic Church, um, you have these rules and their canons, and it's you better, and it's a law, and you better observe it or else. Um, that's not the case in the Orthodox Church. The rules are there for us to, to use to shape our life. Uh, according to the common practice of the church, so that we can uh, so that we can begin to measure our life according to those rules. So, for example, um, when it comes to fasting, there are two aspects of it. One is fasting, which means not eating anything, and the second aspect is abstinence which means you abstain from certain foods. Now, in the ideal practice, which is what, what, the, what the Orthodox rules set forth, the principles set forth, and what they do is they set them very, very high so that uh, there's always something to strive for. In other words, so that you never think that you've achieved it. You always know you're gonna fall short, and in that, hopefully comes a little bit of humility, hopefully. Um, so for example, the fasting, the, the rules of fasting to a great extent are not, are not commonly practiced um, in, in many Orthodox communities, but the rules of abstinence are. So for example, on, when, <clears throat> on Wednesdays and Fridays, you're supposed to abstain every Wednesday and Friday, that is. You're supposed to abstain from meat, from dairy products, from fish, from eggs, from cheese, uh, from wine, in other words, alcohol, and from olive oil. Um, and, you know, the, the quotation from my big fat Greek wedding, you know, oh, it's not, it's not, it's not meat, it's lamb doesn't work, um, you know, and we like to joke and things like that. But the basic rule 
is vegan when it comes down to it, with the exception of seafood. In other words, clams, shrimp, um, octopus, squid, that's okay. But that's about actually the only thing that is, uh, that is permitted on a strict, on a day with strict abstinence. Um, uh, and no milk, no cheese, no butter, no, no animal products at all. Um, now, a lot of places um, don't observe those and a lot of people don't observe those. And it actually becomes, and, but the, mo the more pious people do observe them and they observe them very strictly. Um, it's a good thing to observe them strictly. However, that doesn't mean that you're gonna to go to hell um, if you slip and you have a cookie with some whey in it. Um, and so, or as St. John Chrysostom um, is credited with saying, um, if during Great Lent, you, uh, you, make a, uh, you make a show of fasting and you judge your brother for not fasting, you might as well go have a steak because um, in, instead of consuming the meat, you've consumed your brother. And so there's no fasting there. Um, and of course, uh, there's the famous example of St. Basil the Blessed of Moscow, um, who used to sit on Good Friday he would sit naked on the steps of the cathedral that his, uh, now bears his name and eat sausages uh, while people were going in and out of, of Good Friday services to, in order to show their hypocrisy. Um, I don't suggest that, by the way, you'll get arrested. But one of the things that we need to do the, the way that we use this is that we can, you know, is that we need to pay attention to ourselves and our own practice. And we have to know that if we are judging anybody else for their, um, for how they're fasting or what they're doing, it's all hypocrisy. And that's not their sin, it's our sin. Um, and Hypocrisy is a very bitter thing, um, and we have to be well aware of it. Um, so, but the, but the church's discipline of fasting is, is one that we need to be very, very mindful of. And, um, and as Orthodox Christians, if we're going to be real about it, and if we're going to be pious, and if we're going to be authentic, um, we need to observe both the rules of fasting and the rules of abstinence. So that abstinence basically is um, every Wednesday and Friday um, and during all of the various fasting periods, um, uh, all, Great Lent, um, the uh, Apostles Fast, the, the Dormition Fast and Christmas Lent um, and and to take those very seriously. The fasting rule, the ancient fasting rule that you find implied in all the monastic texts um, of, of the Holy Fathers is that you don't eat anything um, from the time you get up early in the morning uh, to three o'clock in the afternoon, the ninth hour, which is 3 p.m. Um, that's quite a challenge. Now you can probably drink water. That's not a, that's not a big deal, but uh, but the norm is to uh, is to fast that whole uh, that whole time. At least it was um, earlier earlier on in Christian history. So um, now one of the things I would mention is that uh, most young men um, under twenty five can't do that. Um, you have a, uh, 
uh, digestion and, uh, uh, you know, like a blast furnace. And uh, by noon, you'd be about ready to fall over. Um, so you have to moderate your fasting. Um, and do what and and do as as much as you can, uh, not as much as you want to, but do as much as you can. <coughs> There's another another um, aspect of discipline, which is which is very important. The church's discipline is uh, is the services. Now, many most parishes don't have many services. Uh, on a um, relative scale. Um, the typicon of the church, uh, which is actually uh, usually only fulfilled in certain large monasteries <coughs> uh, in full, provides for about eight to 10 hours a day of services. That's a little much if you're living and working in the world. Um, and in fact, Nobody does it. In fact, most monasteries can't even do it. Um, it's too much. Um, it was developed back in the in the seventh, sixth, seventh century um, in its current form, and it's beyond most people, uh, even most monasteries, um, to be able to to do all those services and all of those psalm readings and so forth. However, um, what what is a what you have to come to a um, uh, you have to figure out what you can do and do it. So if your parish has vespers on when on Saturday night or vigil on Saturday night, you should go. If it has matins before liturgy on Sunday morning, you should go. Um, go and be there with the priest and the chanter. That may be the only people who are there. Um, and if it's all in Greek or some other language, well, learn Greek. Um, uh, then uh, many churches will have Vespers on Wednesday nights. Um, uh, if you can go, go. Um, so there are certain parishes, some places have uh, Vespers every day. Some parishes also have matins every day. Um, these are few and far between, but um, if you're close to one of these places, it's a good thing to go and to, um, and to uh, uh, discipline yourself to, uh, to go to the services. But you have to figure out what you can do um, uh, with your work schedule and, um, and, and with your other obligations. Um, playing on the internet is not an obligation. Uh, it's much better to go to service than play on the internet, uh, much less with some kind of a device or something. Um, so uh, that's, uh, we'll talk more about the, about the services. Of course, in the monasteries, uh, the services are what structure our day. Um, and so, uh, there's much more of an under, much more of a um, an understanding that everybody needs to be at all the services in a monastery, um, which can be a lot. Um, now, there's another uh, thing that's very important um, in base in our basic rule of living as an Orthodox Christian, and that's stewardship, stewardship of your financial resources. And probably the best rule that we can have uh, is to tithe. That means to give 10% off the top of your check as it, when it comes in. 10% um, off the top. Um, you, know, don't, you know, don't argue about whether pre-tax or after tax or all of that stuff. Just write the check for 10% of your income and you will find you will find that uh, uh, that not only is this a great blessing, um, but it's also obedience um, to the to a scriptural norm, to the scriptural norm of how to of supporting the church. 
um, this is this is a hard thing, and um, and you you have to do the best you can. Um, if you can't do ten percent, um, at least do at least do something. Uh, but the more invested we are in the church, uh, the more we will, as the Lord said, where your where your treasure is, there is your heart also. Um, so. Uh, so stewardship is is essential, and it's not just money. It's uh, it's your, stewardship of your time. You know, uh, volunteer for projects within the church, and and your talents. If you have have abilities, say you know how to paint, and the parish hall needs to be painted, or something. Somebody's house needs to. Uh, they need help with painting or something, and you can do it. Volunteer. Offer your time and your talents, um, as well as your as your finances, uh, to the support of the church. Um, and finally, within that is another in, incredibly important discipline, and that's the discipline of charity, to give to the poor. Now, uh, in our society. Uh, we have the church has abrogated its responsibility uh, to be the primary uh, locus of assistance for the uh, for people who are in need. Rather, the government has taken that over, um, which, on a moral level, um, is a disaster. Um, now, it's a good thing that there are all these government programs because uh, people have forgotten. Um, their responsibility to take care of those who are needy. But one of the things that we can do is when somebody comes and, and asks us for money on the street or asks us for help, we can give it to them. And one thing that we can certainly give, even if we don't have much in the way of money to give, we can give them a smile and we can acknowledge their personhood Acknowledge that they're a real person who obviously is in need, and and at least that recognition uh, is pro is often much more valuable than the five or ten bucks um, that you might give. So, um, chastity, uh, so fasting, services, stewardship, charity, the basic rules of the church. Another thing that's very important to, under, to know and to study is the rule of faith. In other words, what is the faith of the church? How do you understand the theology? Um, I don't think that's probably a big issue um, with this crew that's, that's listening. Um, I think probably um, half of you have probably read half of the seminary curriculum before you become Orthodox. Um, I did. Um, uh, 40 years ago. Um, that may be a little much, but at least it's, it's very important to understand the teaching of the church um, in regards to its theology, in regards to, uh, to its moral teaching, in regards to how um, services are structured and to all of, all of that kind of information. Um, and here again, it's a discipline. Um, you have to be disciplined. You have to sit down and read, but not just read it through like you would a, a novel, but take, but take notes, ask questions, um, seek to understand. Um, seek to understand the tradition of the church. Follow the footnotes. One of the best things you can do when you study um, a text about the Orthodox faith is to look at the footnotes, look at um, which are the Holy Fathers that are being um, uh, uh, referenced, who's being quoted, all of that kind of thing um, is, is very good. Now, uh, no man, no cry. Um, uh, you ask, is it okay to give the homeless food instead of money? Absolutely. But what matters is the personal touch, that, that you look that person in the eyes and you smile and acknowledge them 
And that's one of the most important things that you can give them. Um, so FDSA, you're welcome. Um, let's see. Now, there's another aspect. Um, uh, of, of discipline. And that's that you need to follow the directions of your spiritual father. Um, you need to have a prayer rule um, and it'll be one that's appropriate to you, which is something that only somebody who knows you and is working with you and uh, preferably hearing your confession um, will be able to give you um, that will benefit you the most. So um, uh, if you're a college student and you have some, you know, some spiritual father who, who decides he's going to give you a, a three-hour prayer rule, that's not going to happen. It's probably not going to happen if he expects you to be up at six o'clock in the morning or even eight, right? Um, so at, have he, your spiritual father, if he, if he knows you and cares about you, will help you to work out what it is that you can do, um, how, much of, how much prayer book prayers, how much of the Jesus prayer, um, uh, what you need to do in preparation for Holy Communion, um, and, uh, and all of these things. And um, I'm going to have a whole section um, on prayer, a whole uh, evening. So I'm not going to go into that in, in, in great deal to, in, uh, in any uh, great detail tonight. Um, but ask your spiritual father for um, a prayer rule that is something that you can, that you can use that, and that, that's good for you. Okay. Um, Okay, and Andre Philippe, uh, what would you recommend to someone who struggles with a lack of with a lack of fear that becomes dangerous with regards to seeking salvation and staying virtuous? Well, I think we need to understand what what that fear is. You know, not all people. There are some people that have a very strong sense. Um, of a fear of, of going to hell or um, a fear uh, or terror, actually, of God. Others do not. Um, but the fear that the, the Holy Fathers talk about three kinds of fear of God. One is, is this kind of terror before God in which we fear that we're going to get sent to hell. That's the fear of a slave. The fear of a, of a hired servant, an employee, is that you're not going to get your reward. You're not going to get your salary. Um, that's kind of a, that's not, not very useful. But the third kind is the fear of the son, which is a fear of offending the love of the father. And it's about learning to love God and to, and, to, and to have a relationship in prayer with God where you experience his love and that you fear to lose that experience of his love. So I don't know what else, what else it um, can say. Jonathan, is it okay to give icons to the homeless as well? Yes. Um, Luthien, if your biological name is already a biblical name, but you feel a connection with a particular saint, could you ask to be named after that saint? Uh, yes, you can. Um, but you can also, uh, 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 you can save it for monastic tonsure. Um, so... If, if you wish, but you, you can, but if you already have a, um, not, not just a biblical name, but, but the name of a saint, for example, 
there are there are plenty of biblical names that are really not they're really not saints. Um, uh, you know, for example, you wouldn't want to be named uh, after Cain <laughs> or, <laughs> or Judas, you know, um, those are biblical names. So, um, but make sure, make sure it's the name of a saint and learn about that saint and maybe, and maybe you'll begin to identify with him. Um, next is, what is the church's position on joining the military? Is it different depending off on if you will see combat or not. Well, I think I strongly encourage many young men to join the military. Um, I am not so sure about the uh, Marine infantry though. Um, I've seen people really severely messed up by that. Um, but uh, there, are plenty of, uh, there are plenty of roles that are um, uh, service roles. If you can become a, if you can become a medic, uh, you can become a chaplain's assistant. You can, um, uh, there are non-combat roles, um, which are, uh, um, which, one, which one can, uh, which one can fulfill. So look and, see, you know, look and see what's available and, and what appeals to you. Um, okay, Manasseh, how do you resist pornography when you're severely addicted to it? Um, I'm going to get to that um, in, a, in a couple minutes with this one, after this one last question. Is it appropriate to give an icon to a Protestant on his birthday, given that he will treat it well? Yes. Who knows? That icon may lead them, lead them into the Orthodox Church. So, um, let's see, liturgical participation. Um, is a whole is a is a whole area of discipline of our life, um, and one of the most uh, one of the most important areas um, is confession. Now, uh, there is there is a confession um, before baptism, which is a life confession, which is very important. Um, it's very important that you. Uh, take several weeks and, and list all of the sins of your entire life uh, that you will confess. But while you're listing them, while you're going through and, and reviewing your life, you, you should be going through a whole process of repentance, and you should be going through a whole process of forgiveness of all of those against whom you bear resentment and anger um, and any kind of uh, ill feeling. Um, so that pre-baptismal um, uh, life confession um, sets, in a sense, it sets the stage, it sets, you, it sets you up because in the baptism, all of your sins are forgiven. Now, if you miss something in the confession, and if you just legitimately miss it, God will, God forgives you anyway. But if you deliberately hide something, um, while God will, while God certainly forgives you that sin, it's going to bug you because you knew you hid it and you knew that you were too ashamed to confess it. Now, Confession is so important because <clears throat> it's one of the essential means that we have of dealing with our, with, not only of dealing with our sin, but dealing with guilt and dealing with shame. Um, and guilt and shame are part of, uh, part of the fruit of sin. Um, when we sin, we feel guilty. However, what guilt is, is the sense that I have done something bad. I've done something wrong. What shame is, is that I am bad because I did these things. It's not about, shame is, shame is a sense of, um, uh, of, be, of feeling, uh, uh, 
damned, of feeling cursed, of feeling uh, rejected. Um, and indeed, you re often in shame, we reject ourselves um, and we're not able to face other people. And the deeper it, the deeper it gets, the more toxic it becomes. Um, this, is, this is very much um, a, uh, an issue um, when it comes to uh, pornography and the masturbation, which goes along with it. Um, when it comes to uh, various other kinds of, of sexual sins, um, there's not only a feeling of guilt, but a feeling of shame. And then there's a, and then there's a, a demoralization that goes along with that, um, which leads to, um, to despondency and leads to a, leads to a sense of um, uh, just spiritual, often to spiritual abandonment. Um, and, and, this is a, and this is actually a very serious thing. Um, and it's, and it's, and the only way to deal with it, um, and Manasseh, uh, uh, this is addressing your, uh, um, you know, your, your question, um, are, when the addiction, the addiction to porn, um, is really not just it's not so much the, the, the porn itself, it's not so much the, the material of the pornography, it's really about masturbation um, more than anything else. Um, because, you know, it's essentially the pornography is an aid to masturbation. Now, there's, um, there are all sorts of, pro uh, of huge, huge issues regarding pornography itself. Um, uh, so much of it is violent. So much of it uh, portrays rape. Um, uh, it totally dehumanizes women in particular. Um, and so, uh, so it's a, uh, so there are huge issues around, um, around pornography itself. Um, most of the women who are, uh, who get into the porn industry don't live much past 35 because having been used and abused um, like that, they basically get sick and die very young. And what a, what a horrific thing that is. So looking, thinking about that, another thing to think about is what if that was your sister? You know, would you would you want her to uh, to be acting like that, to to displaying herself and things like that? That would be a pretty horrific thing. So we can we can erect these mental barriers um, against looking at pornography by you know realizing how um, how how not only um, dehumanizing it is and and how much um, it damages other people, but it also damages us. You know, I've had young guys, 18, 19 years old, um, confess to me that they have erectile dysfunction at 18 or 19 because of the use of porn. They can't get it up unless they have, they have porn to, uh, get them excited. That's pretty sad. If you're 18 or 19 years old, you can't get it up. That's pretty far. That's problematic. Um, uh, <laughs> most 18 and 19 year, years, year olds can't get it down um, more than anything else. So the issue is ultimately an issue of masturbation. Um, you've got you've got the whole all the uh, material about dopamine and all of that kind of stuff and and how it, it releases you know it among other things releases dopamine um, 
which is like hero, which is the same thing that <clears throat> that heroin does. The same thing that other drugs do. Um, same thing that any other any kind of other pleasurable experience does. Um, and so that's part of that addictive pattern. Um, for most for most guys, masturbation is not so much about sex, it's about, um, it's about stress relief. Um, and of course, there's the physical aspect of, of the stress, but there's also um, a psychological aspect of stress. And um, that is, and that also feeds into it. I think the most, one of the most valuable ways of approaching it is to, is to remember that sex is about having children. Sex is about reproduction. Probably one of the most horrific things about the whole sexual revolution, which started in the 60s, um, came with the, uh, with the uh, technology that, uh, of, um, uh, of contraception which essentially, although there's been contraception forever, it hasn't been very good. Um, only recently has it gotten pretty mm, accurate or pretty, uh, pretty good. And so, so, that it, um, so that sex was uh, separated from um, reproduction. And so sex became primarily um, about pleasure. Now, um, according to the teaching of the of the church, and according to the uh, uh, you know un whole understanding of the Holy Fathers, if we're engaging in hedonistic behavior, we're way off base. Um, and. If, and if you're engaging in sex outside of marriage, um, uh, A, you're risking having a child. B, that would, not be, that would not be a good thing for the child. And C, it's fornication, it's sin, it's hedonism, and it's ultimately selfish. Um, we, need our, we need to cut out our, um, our selfishness. Overcoming selfishness is the essence of, of, of growth to spiritual maturity. Um, and so all of, all, of these, all of these things figure in um, to, the, uh, to the struggle against um, the use, use of pornography and all that goes with it. Um, Another thing that, that is extremely um, important is that sex outside of marriage is fornication and is, a, and, is, and is a grave sin and actually something for which you can be excommunicated. Um, you cut yourself off from the chalice if you have sex outside of marriage. Um, and if you have sex with somebody who's married, if you commit adultery, or if you're married and you, and you have sex with another woman and commit adultery, you've, you're not only um, are you uh, risking the marriage to say the least, um, you're sinning against your wife, you're sinning against the other, that, that woman, and you're sinning against yourself, and you're sinning against God, and you are cutting yourself off from the church. Um, so <clears throat> very, it's very important to, uh, uh, to, to keep these things, um, these things in mind. So, um, I, I think, uh, next week I'll continue with, uh, uh, with talking about confession, um, and, uh, and the other, and the other sacraments, um, and then go into uh, into a discussion of 
what are the basic orthodox, what's the basic orthodox approach to relationships? Um, so, um, let's, uh, let's go back to some of these questions. Um, let's see, An Anaxon, with the focus on patristic and theological study, especially in this server, is it not the view of the saints that reading the lives of the saints every day in conjunction with the gospels is the daily milk before even considering reading theological texts? For example, St. Paisius was not allowed to read anything more than the lives of the saints for quite some time. Reading the lives of the saints is a great thing. Um, I would uh, strongly suggest getting a copy, if you can afford it, of the Synexarian um, and, uh, um, and read that every day. But that's not a whole lot of material every day. Um, uh, so there is room for uh, studying other things. First, first the scriptures, um, and then also uh, the, uh, um, uh, you know, some theological texts. But you should have a, a fair degree of maturity in the faith before you start studying theology. Um, good faith. When does God see fit to answer our prayers? How do we strike a balance between asking God for things and just letting his plan play out? It feels strange asking God to heal family members if it was part of his greater plan for them to deal with the tribulation in the first place. Good question. The highest, the highest level of prayer is silence. God knows better than we do, far better than we do, uh, what a person needs. So we don't have to tell him um, uh, what they need. But when we pray for somebody, say for example, you can use the Jesus prayer in, um, in interceding for people. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on so-and-so. Bill or Pat or whatever. Um, and just leave it at that. Uh, Saint Silouan, uh, would pray for people in that he would bring the remembrance of them into the presence of God. Um, all we can pray ultimately is, Lord have mercy on us and your will be done. Um, when we pray for people, it's only thy will be done. Um, we don't need to pray for stuff. Um, we don't need to pray for, um, you know, we don't need to uh, tell God what to do and how to do it. We pray for his mercy, and we pray that not only can, uh, that we will do his will, but that others will, uh, that his will be done in other per people's lives, because we don't know what it is. Um, Dragoon. Is it okay to ask a brother or sister who recently started college if they're doing their prayers? Not out of judgment at all, but compassion. I've been to college and I know the distractions and secular forces which try to drive us away from God. Perhaps as a more encompassing question, I can help someone who is going to college who I, don't, who I very much don't want to fall away from the faith. Uh, they're much more pious than me and I pray for them a lot. Never enough, of course, but I want to be there for them as much as possible. Well, you need, you need to tell them that, and uh, uh, you need to assure them that you are there for them, um, and you need to encourage them. Um, and uh, that brotherly encouragement uh, uh, or sisterly encouragement is a, is a tremendous thing and, uh, and, can, be a, and can be a real, um, and can be a real positive uh, influence on a person. Um, uh, and then, if, if they're having issues or they're having questions or something like that, uh, they know that they can come to you. Um, Dan Ortho. It has been demonstrated that the church fathers never believed in a flat earth, but a ton of fathers believed in a geocentric universe. Have you ever looked into the work of the traditional Catholics 
have done in this area in the last 10 years. They seem to have developed a compelling case. Um, I have not looked into it. Um, um, I don't look to the, uh, uh, to the fathers for um, any kind of uh, scientific um, uh, speculation because I don't, well, that's not, that's not what I look to them for. I look to the ancient fathers <clears throat> for, you know, for, for their spiritual insights. And if they, have, if, they, if they have writings about a geocentric universe, I try and, try and take a look at that and, and see um, how that can be applied um, given our modern scientific understanding of, of how the universe works. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not at all familiar with, the, with what the traditional Catholics have done. So um, it, sound, it sounds interesting. Okay, next. Where is the line between extremes? Anger versus, versus righteous anger, being judgmental versus simply making judgments. How can we be nice without being a pushover or pacifist, yet in defending faith not become self-righteousness? Self-righteous, I find it difficult to find balance in this area. <clears throat> well, um, the scriptures say be angry and sin not. Um, and, I, and another thing, another uh, uh, principle that is very important um, is look at yourself first. If you know your own sins, and if you realize your own sins, your own shortcomings, um, uh, you, you will never judge another person. Um, uh, and if you, because every time we judge somebody else, what we judge them for is what not only inevitably we will fall into, but it's usually about what, what bugs us about ourselves the most that we can see reflected in other people. Um, uh, in other words, all of our judgment of other people is hypocritical. And this is, this is bad. This is very bad. <laughs> and so we need to, to draw, and it comes out of anger, doesn't come not so much out of anger. It comes out of conceit. It comes out of arrogance and it comes out of pride. And we need to fight these things um, as, as much as we possibly can. Um, so, uh, I think the most important thing is that we, is that we pay attention to ourself and to, and to not look at what other people are doing. And, um, uh, you also have to ask, is it your place to, uh, make a judgment? Now you can, you can, you, if you obviously that somebody is, is doing something wrong, probably the better approach is to, 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 to realize, ah, he, him today, me tomorrow and yesterday, um, that we're no better and no different than those people who are doing things wrong um, because we do things wrong and we, and we um, through our own, arrogance and through our own conceit, uh, don't even realize um, how far short we fall. So this is, this is the approach of humility. Um, real humility is, is, has got to be one of the most Im important things that we strive for. Okay. Um, Good faith. What are the church's teachings regarding sexuality within a loving marriage? Are there specific restrictions outside of church calendar related restrictions? Well, as a matter of fact, there are. Um, uh, just because you're married doesn't mean that anything goes. Um, probably the most important rule, um, the most pr important principle is that you never do anything that either violates your conscience or the conscience of your partner. Um, of course, your partner has to be somebody of the opposite sex. Um, the church uh, does not uh, accept any kind of um, 
union, much less a so-called marriage um, between people of the same sex. Um, so for example, uh, any, any, anything that, uh, uh, any kind of sodomy, any kind of uh, perverse practices um, are forbidden within the church and are sins and can be penanced, quite frankly. Um, uh, there's a long list of uh, uh, such practices that are, uh, that are penanced and um, that's the most important principle is that sexuality within marriage is about procreation. It's about having children. And you only do any, the only, and the only kinds of sexual expression that are appropriate um, are ones that are, uh, that lead to the uh, begetting of children. Um, uh, so you can imagine all of the things that don't uh, lead to that, and um, which I don't suggest that you do. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and, it's, and it's important to be disciplined um, within that. You know, I think one of, the, one of the things that within marriage that's really important, it's not about gratification of your lust. It's about, it's not, and it's not actually not just about uh, begetting children. It's about expressing love and um, and that expression of love, make uh, sex as making love, um, I think will give you a whole, um, uh, a, whole a whole range of, um, of activities in which you can understand sex as making love rather than some kind of selfish activity of, um, uh, using the other to get off, so. Um, actually, if you look, <clears throat> I usually don't suggest it, but um, uh, there is a book called The Eximolo Guitarian by St. Nicodemus the Hagiorite, uh, which actually lists all the various hmm, possibilities of, um, sexual athletics um, with appropriate penances of usually of excommunication for numbers of years. Um, you're not likely to get that in a, uh, from a parish priest, but if you go to certain Greek monasteries, um, you might find yourself cut off for 10 years. Okay, Dragoon. Um, Yes, the Synaxarian, I would, I would suggest, um, <clears throat> is, <clears throat> excuse me, the Synaxarian, I would suggest, is the one um, coming from Mount Athos. Um, it's now being uh, uh, sold by St. Sebastian Press, uh, which is the Serbian Diocese of Los Angeles. Um, it, it's six volumes or seven volumes, um, and it's expensive. It's two hundred and fifty bucks for the for the seven volumes, but it's well worth it. So, what else? Okay. So, um, does anybody have any more questions? Um, your minutes. I did have a question of a voice if you had time to sure. entertain those sure. for a little bit. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, uh, you, you've mentioned a few times that you're going to talk about spiritual fathers in the future, and you did a little today 
Um, when when do you think it's appropriate for someone who's like a catechumen um, to kind of start to seek out a spiritual father? Um, well, basically, after you're baptized, um, if you uh, your parish priest will function as your as your spiritual father at first. <clears throat> But for example, if you want to go to, uh, if you want to join a monastery, you find the spiritual father um, in, by, uh, by going to the uh, abbot of that monastery and you join and, and you ask him to be your spiritual father and you ask him to become a novice. Um, if you're uh, um, in, uh, if, you're, if you're in the world and <clears throat> either aiming, aiming towards marriage or already married, um, uh, you, uh, usually, usually your parish priest um, is a good person to go to for, uh, certainly for confession and for, you know, somebody who knows you, somebody who, who you can communicate with. Um, uh, and if you, if you do find a spiritual father, so you go to a monastery and, and you, um, and you really feel that you want to uh, develop a, a relationship of spiritual fatherhood with that with that abbot, um, uh, then that is certainly possible. But it's a, it's all about uh, uh, living a relationship of uh, of obedience. Um, um, and probably uh, probably next time. Um, I'll also begin to talk about monasticism, which is the sacrament of obedience. So, um, okay, somebody, um, okay, uh, hold on here. Okay, um, Okay. Uh, Luthien, should you wait until you get a spiritual father before delving too deep into the Philokalia? Um, well, readings volume one through four is the Philokalia. Uh, now there's volume five also. Um, so that's delving pretty deep. Um, uh, I would suggest um, uh, that that you that you wait until you get a spiritual father who can direct you uh, in that. Um, there's a couple things, a few things in volume one uh, that you can read, but digging into the other volumes, um, I would not suggest. Volume one, um, take a look, and I think you'll be able to to see what is what is beyond you. Um, and what is not. Um, Dragoon, um, uh, the Synaxarian is the lives of the saints. Um, only it's set up for every day. And so it, it has stories of the stories of the lives of the saints um, in a, a reasonable length um, for each day of the year. Um, so, Mr. Machiavelli, how do we determine if one should dissociate with bad influences in our lives? When do we try to encourage change and when do we walk away from someone? Well, if somebody is leading you into sin, then you probably need uh, to uh, either to change, to change that relationship. And, um, and, if, and if it's... Uh, and if they are not willing to, uh, uh, to change and to stop leading you into sin, then you need to break off that relationship. So, um, uh, 
it's hard, but that's, but that's the reality. Jonathan, um, may the Lord God bless you abundantly. Um, good faith. Um, Uh, can you explain your understanding of animals in the afterlife? Jay mentioned he thought there would be a Garden of Eden type life with animals. Um, well, I think Jay is probably on the right track. Um, it's hard. It's hard to imagine. You know, the 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 whole the world will be recreated. Everything will everything will be made new. Um, how is there going to be a world without animals? Um, that's a wonderful thing. So, um, somehow God will save, we, we have to leave it up to God's providence, um, as to what, uh, um, as to what paradise will be like, but I have trouble imagining paradise without animals. Is any okay, Tibu? Um, what if you live in a place with no Orthodox parishes but churches of other denominations? Um, well, I would try and find out what the closest Orthodox church is, and try and figure out how often uh, you would be able to get there. Um, maybe there are other Orthodox Christians living in your immediate area and a mission could be established. Um, but uh, uh, I would call the closest Orthodox churches and find out um, uh, where, you know, where they might be. Okay, uh, in Christ, a follow up. What if the unrepentant, unchangeable person who influences your life negatively is a parent or loved one who you depend upon for various things? Well, this is, this is a very um, difficult question um, because, and a very common situation. Um, one of the most important things that we need uh, to remember is that um, is that we do have filial responsibility towards our parents. We do have responsibility to care for them and to honor them. However, that does not mean that we uh, can let, have to let them hold us back from uh, pursuing, the, uh, pursuing Christ and, um, uh, you know, and, and doing what we need to do in order to do that. Um, uh, it's not a matter of defiance. It's a matter of um, uh, taking responsibility for your own life. And ultimately, you need to take responsibility for your own life and um, uh, lessen the amount of dependence that you have upon, upon those who are... Um, uh, negatively affecting your life. Um, it's always a matter of, uh, of detachment. Um, and, this is a, and this can be a very difficult thing. We have to remember the Lord's words. If you love father or mother more than me, you're not worthy of me. If you love son or daughter, or wife or children more than me, um, you're not worthy of me. This is very difficult. Um, but um, it and it's and it's a complex thing because it involves both taking responsibility for our own life, um, fulfilling our filial responsibility uh, to our family, um, and yet uh, doing what we uh, following God as we need to follow Him. Um, so, <clears throat> and the best the best way is to. Um, start to depend less on that person and uh, uh, take care of your own needs. Um, Prokhor, uh, 
would I recommend the, reading the prologue from Okrid? Um, the, the prologue is very good. It was uh, put together by Saint, Saint um, uh, Nikolai Velimirovich, um, who has little sermons um, uh, for every day. It's very short. Unfortunately, the lives of the saints are very short and very um, um, uh, what would you how would you call it? Well, they're according, they're, they're formulaic. So, um, so, so the, the, the little sermons by, uh, by St. Nikolai are, are solid gold, but the, the lives of the saints, it's, it's barely a very, it's a, just a very, very, short summary, so that's not so great. Um, Nix, in, so in today's society, depression and anxiety seem to be a great problem. What do you think is the cause of this besides the fall? And what can one who has anxiety, specifically social anxiety or depression do to cure or to ease this problem? <clears throat> well, um, I think a lot of the depression and anxiety in our culture comes from having our spiritual eyes blinded and from not being able to perceive the presence of God who will, um, who will uh, console us and, and, and will give us strength to, uh, um, uh, to persevere. I really believe that this is the cause not only of, um, uh, of depression, but, but also of the kind of nihilism that is uh, so rampant, especially among our young people. Um, social anxiety is a is something I'm only recent. I've only recently begun to be acquainted with. Um, um, I'm rather of an extrovert, and so uh, social anxiety is not something I um, uh, <laughs> I personally uh, have experienced. Um, but uh, I think also part of it is to learn how to deal with your thoughts, is to, to learn to be able to ignore thoughts, which include feelings, which, in, which include, include even the feelings of anxiety, which are still thoughts, they're logismi. Um, um, and even depression um, can often be partly on the level of thoughts. Depression can also be chemical, um, and so that has its own has its own issues. Um, but learning how to deal with your thoughts um, is uh, is to a great extent the uh, the best way of overcoming um, anxiety. Um, Leonard, how does one who becomes a monk or nun arrange for the care? of aging parents? Well, <clears throat> actually, it differs with each person. Um, uh, in my own situation, um, I was the abbot of the monastery and I knew that I had to, uh, to take financial responsibility for my parents. Um, and that was one of the things that, um, uh, One of the ways I justified um, accepting, accepting the uh, offer to become a bishop because I knew it would financially, I would, it, I would be, uh, have enough finances to uh, care for my aging parents. Um, so some uh, monks or nuns will be uh, given a blessing to go and to, and to live with them if necessary. Uh, Others will go and visit them frequently. Depends on what the, uh, um, if there's other siblings. Um, it depends on each particular situation and each particular monastery. Um, but we still absolutely uh, maintain, we still absolutely have that, that filial obligation. And I think our Lord Jesus Christ was very plain about that uh, in his teaching.
So, um, so that's that's I think uh, uh, something we need to look at. Good faith. Um, how do new Orthodox Christians go about trying to bring our loved loved ones to God without indulging his pride as their savior and without pushing them away? When I was an atheist, I always thought it was a contradiction that some believers would try to try to save their children from alcoholism, um, but not try to save their children from eternal damnation. Well, yes, it is. <laughs> um, but what we need to do is we need to um, to be able to speak to them without without shoving it down their throats. Um, remember, we've got to respect their free will. Um, it's a uh, it's a personal decision that they themselves need to make, but you can you can share your experience um, and the joy that you have from it. Um, so uh, I would uh, um, I would I would approach it I would approach it that way. Um, but you can never th one of the really important uh, principles is. We can never save anybody. Only Jesus Christ saves people. Um, and that is if they want it. If they don't want it, that's their business. Um, but our Lord Jesus Christ wants everyone to be saved. Um, Quack, what's the best book to learn about St. Ephraim the Syrian? Um, I would take a look and, uh, and see what's available and just read anything you can about him. Um, his poetry is, is amazing. Um, and it's also, um, there are books about uh, the Syriac fathers, um, which, which you can find, but you'd have to look like, you can even take a look on Amazon um, and you'll find things. I don't, I don't know that literature. Okay. Um, George, I think I will be ending this um, momentarily. Um, let's uh, uh, let me finish these questions. These questions that are on the board right now, and then we'll okay. 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 Um, Raiden, just saw the Synaxarian from Sebastian Press. Um, I don't know where you can get where you can get the French, um, but uh, you might. Uh, you might ask them. It actually comes from uh, Ormelia Monastery, on, um, which is associated with Simonopetra on Mount Athos. Um, you can also do some online research um, and just, you know, plug the Cynix, plug in Cynixarian in French. Um, so, Tibu, uh, do you have any advice on clearing your mind while uh, while in prayer? Um, <clears throat> It takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. Um, and so this is a, uh, um, uh, we'll, we'll, talk, we'll talk at some length about the practice of, of contemplative prayer, which, um, which includes the practice of clearing your mind. Um, but what it is, it, it means learning how to, how to focus, how to concentrate, um, and, and how to and and how to uh, enter into that spiritual noetic awareness um, and uh, and ignore the thoughts that go through your rational mind. Um, so the point is keep practicing. Okay, so can we end here tonight? Absolutely, Reminence. Okay. Again, thank you for the time. Well, yes. my joy. And uh, so let's pray. Yeah. It, it is truly me to bless the Theotokos, ever blessed and most pure, and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption, thou gave us birth to God the Word. True Theotokos, we magnify thee. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always known to ages of ages. Thank Amen. you, Reminence. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. And, and 